Hello and welcome to today's conversation with Scott Kelly, whose recently completed year-long mission aboard the International Space Station continues to provide valuable insights for NASA's journey to Mars. I'm Tabitha Thompson with NASA's Office of Communication. Today we'll hear from Scott about the one-year mission and his career at NASA. Then he'll take your questions from across NASA centers. We also received a large number of great questions via email in advance. Thank you for those. We'll get to as many of those as possible as well. But first, let's start with a look back at the one-year mission. Throughout history, people have done things that are risky. Even though it is a risky thing to be doing, and I think it's a lot more risky than some people might think, so I still think it's worth it. Astronaut Scott Kelly will try something no American has ever done before. This spring, he will leave for a mission and spend a year in space. His twin is former astronaut Mark Kelly. Genetically, the brothers are almost identical, so scientists will be able to measure how Scott and Mark change physically and emotionally as months pass. Warm up a little bit. This one's a bit of a Hail Mary. Here we go. Boom! Astronaut Scott Kelly at the International Space Station. Scott Kelly has been working toward this mission his entire career. He's been working toward this mission his entire life in some respects. I decided that the challenges staying in space for a whole year presented uh, was appealing to me even considering the sacrifices. The human body was made for living in gravity. Strange things happen to us when we spend long periods of time without it. But that never deterred the former Navy test pilots from dreaming of becoming astronauts. Pretty much anything we've ever put our mind to, we've been able to accomplish. Doing uh, pretty good. I do feel like I've been up here for a, a really long time and I look forward to, to getting home soon. Interesting to watch. What a, a cool great story. Great story and a fascinating experiment. Space is still the most exciting thing I can imagine and talking to someone in orbit still is, uh, it's like I am an astronaut right now. Are you concerned about the, the toll, the physical toll that this will take on you? I do think about the effects of uh, radiation. You know, the reason I'm here is to learn more about it so someday we can travel further from low Earth orbit than we ever have before. A year is not short, but it was very rewarding. It was uh, enjoyable. It was something that I feel privileged to having got to do. Hello everyone, good afternoon, good morning to some. So keep clapping in the spirit of this all hands, this is all throughout NASA. Uh, let's give another hand um, to our guest and honor uh, Scott Kelly. I'm fond of quoting Eleanor Roosevelt, saying that the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And one of the truly exciting things about Scott and ours, NASA's year in space, is that it encouraged so many people around the world to dream, to believe, to hope. So many people looked at those 700 images that Scott posted on social media, I know I did, and uh, now I'll be watching the IMAX movie, A Beautiful Planet, and that just inspires. That's the most powerful inspiration we could hope for. I remember as a young girl growing up in Montana dreaming by Apollo. And um, just really amazing, to, just dreaming to be part of the space program. Look at how fortunate I am here to be in front of you all now. And so that dream is, is a well in life. I know that what you're doing, um, Scott, is, is having the same exact effect on kids and, and the general public alike, and, and all of us, all of us uh, folks at NASA. You're literally reaching millions and millions of people here in the U.S. and around the world, and that's, that's what we can hope for. That's what we want to bring 
all of humanity with us on all of our exploring. And, and Scott has really done that in terms of the message of hope and inspiration, exploration, and I think really showing and bringing out the best in all of us. It's also raising awareness about our journey to Mars. As you know, space station is, is the first phase of our journey to Mars. And Scott's 520 hours in space have incre made incredible impact on this journey. From the study that Scott and Mark volunteered for to teach us about the effects on the human body and long duration and the genetics that we've never been able to do until tell Scott's mission. To the nearly 400 experiments that Scott conducted on space station during his year in space alone. To Scott's working on all of his previous missions that led up to this culmination in, in his career. So all told, between his service to NASA and his service to the US Navy, Scott's logged more than 8,000 hours and more than 40 different aircraft and spacecraft. Pretty awesome, pretty amazing. He's forever changed the way Americans, and I would say the entire world, really view exploration and possibility and open us up to those big, grand dreams. So I hope you'll join me in one more round of applause. Welcome and thank you, thank you, Scott Kelly. Say hi to my former crewmate over there, Katie Coleman. Is this the place to stand right here? Well, thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. It's great to be anywhere with gravity now, after nearly a year in space. You know, on that space station, I changed positions so many times, you would have thought I was running for president. And I can say that now because I am no longer subject to the Hatch Act. <laughs> Different, different kind of life. You know, spending a year in space, a year of my life, or nearly a year, it was a really, really long time. And you wonder, why spend a year in space? Well, like Dr. Newman said, it's to learn. It's to push our boundaries of what we are capable of, both our own physiology from a psychological standpoint, but also how to operate the systems on board the space station for a really long period of time. So someday, hopefully in the not too distant future, we're gonna be able to go to Mars. And I'm very excited and feel privileged to have been, been a part of this and hopefully you know, I'll continue to be a part of NASA's journey to Mars. You know, People often ask me what's the best part about flying in space? Is it the launch, the landing, is it looking at Earth, which is incredibly beautiful. Is it floating around in zero G? All those things are great, but the best part about doing this, the best part of it for me, is working on something that is incredibly, incredibly hard, making this my life work, working hard at it, and then being proud of being successful. And I wanna make it clear, this is not my mission in space. This is our mission. This is NASA's mission. This is our country's mission to have me and my colleagues stay on the International Space Station for 340 days. And I just want to stress that's something that all of you and all of those watching on television should be very, very proud of because it is not easy. It's one of the hardest things that I think we have done. What I'd like to do is show my video and I have a, a video I'm going to narrate um, for a little bit, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more, um, and then we'll have the opportunity to have some questions and uh, hopefully some answers. So we can roll the video here. And this is the uh, you know the typical post-flight flight video, meaning that I really haven't seen this before. <laughs> and this starts off in Kazakhstan with me and Gennady and my uh, good friend there, Misha, getting ready to launch from there. And as you can see, it does not look like the Kennedy Space Center, but it is very, uh, very functional. And unlike the, uh, unlike the space shuttle, they stand this rocket up just a couple of days before and get it ready. And that's us uh, getting into the Soyuz and getting our gloves on. And we launched at night 
in uh, late March of last year. And when you are leaving the planet, whether it's on the space shuttle or the Soyuz, it looks like it's launch lifting off slowly there, but when you're in it, there's nothing slow about it. You get the feeling you're going somewhere, you're not sure where you're going, <laughs> but you know you're not coming back to the launch pad. And right about this time, Gennady says to Misha and I, he says, a year in space. You guys are, and I'll blank out the word, the expletive, but he said, you guys are heroes. <laughs> and we said, Gennady, you're our hero because you're getting us up there safely. And actually, he spent more days in space than anyone else, so he's, 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 he's the real deal. But this is the space station. You know, you got a lot of you people have worked on it. It's really a magnificent facility. And uh, seeing it from the Soyuz, you get a kind of a fleeting glimpse at, out the window of it at times, at least from the right seater's window as the Soyuz turns to do its uh, rendezvous burn. And as you're approaching it, and what you're thinking at, at this point is, man, this is probably a really dumb idea. <laughs> to be spending a year on the space station. But Misha and I went through the, uh, the hatch together and we had, we had planned that about 10 seconds before. I said, Misha, get over here. We gotta go through the hatch together because this is, this is a team effort between, between him and I and all of you. Um, the space station is really a, a magnificent uh, facility. Like Dr. Newman was saying, over the course of the year I, I was there, we did 400 different experiments in uh, all different kinds of scientific disciplines, whether it's uh, you know basic physics, like you know doing the uh, Spears experiment there, and Misha assists with some of this uh, science, or you know things like combustion research, making uh, new combustion processes and understanding those to make more efficient uh, engines or rocket engines. We also um, grew some plants with the uh, veggie experiment, which was a great experiment. Um, we had the lettuce that we grew first, and that worked great, but when we, when we tried to grow a flowering plant, it didn't, it didn't work too well until, uh, until I got permission to kind of put my hands on the flowers and feel them and try to decide myself when they needed to be watered because they were either too wet or, uh, or, or too dry and they were they were dying. Here's a, a picture of uh, Chell and I doing something. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what it is. But uh, when I was there, I was there with 14 different people over the course of the year, one of them uh, being Misha, my Russian colleague that we uh, spent nearly the entire year together. And this is using the Japanese airlock to launch one of the nano rack uh, CubeSats that uh, you know, it was a good example of commercialization in space and how we, uh, you know, can use the ISS as a research platform. I talked earlier about the, uh, the combustion experiments we do and, you know, intentionally lighting a fire in space is not, you know, it's not necessarily the, uh, the smartest thing to do, but we're able to do it safely and, and learn a lot uh, from doing this. The life science research on board the space station is, uh, like I was saying earlier, cru crucial to our future journey to Mars, as well as understanding, you know, how our immune system behaves in, uh, you know, in, in the microgravity environment. And that was part of the, uh, the twin study with my brother that we did is in comparing, um, you know, our, our physiology with him as the control subject on the ground. We had a bunch of visiting vehicles um, this was about halfway through the mission when uh, Sergei Volkov and uh, Andy Mogensen came on board. And what's funny about this is I did not know what Aiden looked like when he came through the hatch. I had never seen a picture of him before, but I figured that was okay because it wouldn't be too hard to figure out which guy he was because I knew the other two guys pretty well. And this is uh, with nine of us on board the space station. And this is right before they're leaving. And Gennady, who we had spent uh, six months on board the space station, was getting ready to leave. And I was trying to sneak in there behind them. <laughs> Not that I was really ready to come home at that point. 
We had uh, a bunch of visiting vehicles. Unfortunately, we launched launched a progress, loss of progress early on in our flight. And then we, as you know, we lost the uh, SpaceX resupply ship uh, right thereafter. So we were really counting on the HTV to, to get on board and get on board successfully. Although this isn't the, the HTV, this is the uh, orbital sciences vehicle that uh, Chell captured. This, some of this video is kind of uh, out of order uh, you know, that being the inside of the HTV when they were showing the, us grabbing uh, Orbital right before Chell and, and Kimia had left. But uh, yeah, when we lost those two vehicles, it was a uh, little dicey there for us. We were talking about how, you know, what, what supplies we were going to have to uh, start rationing. We actually gave some of our food to, the, um, to our Russian colleagues because they were running low on certain things. But fortunately, HTV launched, and uh, you know, one good thing about how NASA does business is we always try to have a backup plan. And uh, but it was great to get HTV on board. Some uh, Earth views of our beautiful planet. You know, one one thing that's striking about Earth when you're looking at it from space is just how fragile the uh, atmosphere is. And I'll talk a little bit more of that about that later. Over the course of the 340 days I was there, we did uh, six spacewalks. The Russians did two of them. Uh, I did three of them. And, uh, and Tim and Tim, who are still up there, did, did one as well. And, uh, and talk about a hard job. It's uh, not fun while you're doing it. It's this type two fun kind of thing that, that is fun when you're done. And, uh, but it is a, uh, an incredible experience. And uh, here's Kimia putting us outside for the, uh, for the very first time, which is really, I think, the most critical job uh, of all the EVA um, disciplines, whether it's us outside or the folks on the ground. The person that's actually putting us in the suit, you know, plays the most important role as far as the safety of what we're, what we're doing outside. But uh, the three spacewalks we did, uh, we, we fixed the, uh, or we helped to improve the end effector of the robot arm and uh, did some upgrades to AMS and the insulation on the first spacewalk. And then we, um, we uh, put the ammonia cooling system of the space station back into its original configuration. And then we had this third spacewalk that was sort of my fault that we had to do it because we, we found out that the CETA cart on the outside of the space station was the brakes were on. And I was the last guy to be on that thing right there, pulling on the brake handles. So I take full yellow responsibility. Here's us talking about the, uh, the ammonia on shell suit. You know, there was one point when we're doing the spacewalk that they're, we're talking about losing attitude control of the space station and then potentially what that would mean to our comm. And I'll tell you what, at that point, you realize that despite all these really smart people on the ground that help do these spacewalks, you really have to rely on the person you're out there with if anything goes wrong. And uh, it was kind of an eye-opening uh, feeling uh, for me in terms of the, uh, you know, in terms of the teamwork that uh, especially between the, the two EVA buddies that it takes. And here's, here's just a great view of how uh, brilliant, brilliant blue the uh, planet Earth looks. But you're out there in your own spaceship and uh, completely focused on, on what you're trying to do. You know, living in space makes uh, most things hard, including dealing with your carrots and your food. And this is early on when Samantha and uh, Terry Burtz were up there and they quickly, uh, you know, within a few weeks left. And this is in September during the, uh, the nine crew ops we had on board, which is uh, you know, quite a uh, fun time. But, you know, I'm, I'm, you guys have heard all this before, but you know, microgravity makes most things harder to do. And I saw Chell at the end of the space station. He was filming this video and I flew all the way down the length of the module and I just had to 
tackle him because he was he was completely at my mercy. <laughs> but playing with uh, you know balls of water is fun, and you know this looks like we're goofing around most of the time. But to be honest with you, you're working from the time you get up practically until the time you go to sleep. Uh, when you wake up in the morning, you're at work. When you go to sleep, you're at work. You never leave. Even though the space station is a, uh, an incredible place to live and work in a great facility, uh, when you're there for so long, um, I, I wouldn't say I ever got bored, but sometimes I definitely felt I had, had been living my whole life up there. And uh, especially after spending 500 days total on the space station, I feel like I'm uh, intimately familiar with the place. I got so good at this that I could like do a backflip from one from node one and make it all the way into node two. Shell got pretty good at moving around on the space station as well. I'm not even sure what this is. I think it's probably gonna be pictures of looking at the earth. And like I said, incredibly beautiful place. This is from the US laboratory module. And uh, you know, I took a lot of pictures of the earth and I, posted them on social media and, and I the way I felt about it, it was, is it was uh, you know something I wanted to engage the public with it was fun for me it was fun to make the pictures look as good as they possibly could and I did obviously use some artistic license in doing this There's 16 sunrises and sunsets every single day and uh, you know they always look different and never never get old these are views of uh, probably somewhere, actually that looked like the U.S. And a bunch of my, uh, my Instagram pictures. And obviously, you know, some of this is, uh, some of this is video. But one thing you're keenly aware of is the effect that we have on the environment. There was one day when I was looking out at China and I realized I could see all these cities, 200 cities with over a million people and I've never been able to see them before. And then the next day on the news, I, I heard that the Chinese government had turned off all the coal producing plants in that part of China. And the sky completely cleared. And in China and India, if people were to tell me that there are kids that don't believe the sky is blue, I would absolutely believe them. You know, it was weird getting up with, uh, getting up there, and then a couple of months later having Shell and Kimia and Oleg Kononenko, and Shell and Kimia had never flown before. And then, so they're brand new rookies, and I saw them show up, and they're like baby birds. And then six months later, they soar away, soar away like eagles. These uh, seasoned veter veterans that I just watched them um, you know, just watch them grow in their abilities to live and work in space. You know, eventually it was time for me to come home after nearly uh, nearly a year being up there. And when you're when you're in the shuttle coming home, it's kind of like driving down Park Avenue in a Bentley, but the Soyuz is more like you know flipping your pickup truck off into the woods. <laughs> it's like it's like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel, but while you're on fire. And as soon as you realize. You're not going to die. It's the most fun you've ever had in your life. 24 hours later, I'm back in Houston. I got home. The first thing I did was I jumped into my swimming pool. I ate a big Texas steak. I slept in a bed. I took a shower for the first time in nearly a year. And the best part about this was just the satisfaction of doing the hardest thing I will ever do in my life and being proud of that. You know, when I was backing away from the space station for the last time I will probably ever see it, I looked out at this incredible space station that we've built with this international partnership of 15 countries in different languages, using different engineering standards in, in some cases, putting this thing together while flying around the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour in a vacuum in extremes of temperatures, and I was inspired that if we can do this, the hardest thing we have ever done, 
we can do anything. If we choose to go to Mars, we can go to Mars. If we want to cure cancer and we put the resources behind it, we can cure cancer. I think I'm a true believer now if we can dream it, we can do it. It takes teamwork, it takes effort. We should never give up. And someday, I hope, maybe there's some kids in here, I think the person that is alive, that will walk on Mars, is definitely alive today. And I was really inspired and very, very proud to be a part of this, a part of our year in space mission. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you for the great description of your year in space. And I think we all especially enjoyed that vivid description of landing. That was an, an excellent touch. Uh, so we're gonna go first to our questions that we've gotten via email, or first question at least, and then we'll go to the centers and then I'll give them an opportunity to queue up with their questions. The first one is, with respect to your previous missions, can you comment on the physiological differences based on the length of your mission? Yeah, so I flew, my first flight was seven days to the Hubble Space Telescope, my second 13, which was to the space station aboard the space shuttle. My third, 159 days, I was there with Katie for about four months. And then this one, 340 days. And if you, if you graph these, it's someone, some smart person told me this is a second order polynomial. Some of you <laughs> folks might not understand what that is. I didn't quite understand what it is, but anyway. If I was to fly again, my next flight would have to, to keep on this curve, it would have to be over five years. So I'm either going to Mars or I'm not flying in space again. But as far as how I felt after the flight, I, between 159 days and 340 days, I think it seems pretty linear to me. In other words, this flight was twice as long and I felt twice as bad. When I got out of the Soyuz, you might see that I didn't really look too bad, but that was only because I'm a very good actor. I think I should be nominated for an Academy Award. And my goal here was not to look great, I just had to make sure I didn't look worse than the two guys I was with. <laughs> my colleagues would never let me hear the end of it. But, you know, quickly uh, after I got back, uh, you know, I've talked about this, you know, just being really, really sore and stiff. Um, you know, my skin that had not touched anything in a really, you know, in 340 days, except, you know, just your, just your clothing, anything it touched was completely, uh, you know, felt like it was on fire. I actually had some, uh, you know, like, uh, like rashes and kind of discoloration anywhere I had contact. And then uh, I kind of had flu-like symptoms for a few days. Had I not been in space for a year and I knew what this was, I would have gone to the emergency room and uh, said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm really, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I'm not feeling that great. But that's why we do this. I mean, we need to learn these things if we're going to go to Mars. And I think, you know, from, you know, Misha and I doing this and maybe other people doing it again in the future, you know, we're going to figure this out. I think, you know, if we're going to spend years and years in space and not land on Mars or go somewhere else, you know, we're going to probably need some kind of artificial gravity to, to help. Um, you know, but hopefully we'll go to Mars and it'll take us six months to get there and we'll spend a bunch of time on the surface and rock it back another six months. So uh, very, very exciting. Great, thank you. Uh, we have uh, a question from headquarters or an opportunity to take a question from headquarters. If you have a question, please just, um, great. Wait for the mic runner, I'm sorry, just so everybody can hear. Hi, my name is Wanda Green. I work with, um, Office of Communications and Public Inquiries Office. This may sound like a funny question, but I'm serious about, um, was there ever a moment where you were like, OMG, I really have to get out of this facility? <laughs> yeah. You know, May. Was there for six weeks, and I'm thinking, you know, it's uh, yeah. Does that sound better? Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, 
You know, it's like July, and I'm thinking July, August, September, October, November, December, <laughs> January, February. And I'm thinking, you know, this is a really, really long time. And, uh, but it wasn't like, I, I never quite felt like I was like climbing the walls. The space station is pretty spacious. I never felt like it, I would be happier if it was any bigger. So, and I think, you know, NASA chooses people to do this job that probably, you know, you wouldn't want someone that was claustrophobic doing it. So, yeah, I think uh, I never felt like I really had to get out of there. But when I was leaving, I f did feel a little sense of relief. Hey, it's great, you know, getting back to Earth. Everything is on Earth, practically. <laughs> all, the, all the good stuff. Uh, Scott, you talked uh, about veggie and how the transition when uh, you went from growing lettuce to growing flowers and the time when you were able to uh, do or make the decision on your own about whether to water or what you needed to do. The veggie team at Kennedy Space Center would like to know whether uh, you think other astronauts would prefer independent gardening versus having all the operations scheduled. You know, ideally, if, if something can be completely automated and it works well, I think that's best because then it gives the people the time to do other things that can't be automated. So, you know, for even the veggie experiment, if it's, you know, for me, uh, you know, there, I did have a sense of satisfaction taking care of the plants, but I do understand how uh, expensive crew time is. So had that been possible to be automated, I think that would have been better and you could just go and, you know, check on the plants at, at your leisure. But, uh, you know, in this case with the, the, the veggie, with the zinnia flowers, you know, one thing I learned is there's, you know, there's all kinds, of, there's different approaches to doing things. And, you know, a lot of times we do these experiments that are very closely controlled by the ground, and there are very good reasons for that. But in this case, it was clear that that was not going to work. There was too much of a delay in the amount of time it took to decide what to do with the flowers and what they actually needed. And it really wasn't until I just started, like I said earlier, you know, feeling them and touching them and, uh, you know, figuring out what, uh, you know, what, what they needed and, you know, how to take care of them that they did come back. And I, it was funny, I ex was talking to one of my Russian colleagues about why we were doing this experiment. And they said how, or I told them, you know, in the future we want to fly some flowering plants that we can eat, like a tomato, you know, and... It was interesting, the Russian perspective, he said, well, why would you fly a, why would you want to grow a tomato and eat it? Why wouldn't you grow a potato? And it was just interesting hearing that from one of my Russian colleagues, because he goes, you know, you can live on a potato. You can't live on a tomato. I think there's a movie about that. Yeah. Um, we were very excited, uh, this is again from the, the veggie team, when you decided to take over care of the zinnias. And so, um, as you said, uh, they were looking out for ways to help the crew move to independent gardening for the journey to Mars. So I think that, that conversation speaks to that. Uh, we have a call now, or a question now from Glenn. Scott, thinking about your uh, experience now and uh, looking ahead to a Mars mission or an asteroid mission, what do you think would be the number one engineering challenge to get humans there and back uh, safe enough and healthy enough? You know, I, I think there are a few challenges. One is the uh, protecting the crew from radiation. You know, if you're going to take... Um, six months to get there and you're away from the protection of Earth, I think it's pretty clear that that's one of our engineering challenges. There are other, other challenges, of course. Um, you know, I would want a, a, a system that takes less work by the crew um, for scrubbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. I was, you know, we were always, uh, you know, working hard and needing spare parts to keep the Cedra running on the space station, and I wouldn't, I'd be a little bit uh, cautious to take, and uh, a little bit uncomfortable, to be honest with you, taking our Cedra to Mars if, uh, you know, if you couldn't take, you know, the amount of spare parts or extra parts. I think we need to have a more reliable uh, capability to scrub carbon dioxide, but there are other challenges. I was asked while I was on the space station by this reporter, I was doing an interview, and they, the reporter said, 
hey, now that NASA has determined that there is in fact liquid water on Mars certain, during certain times of the year, is that gonna help us get to Mars any quicker? And my answer was, I don't know, maybe, maybe it will. But if we found money on Mars, <laughs> then we would get there really, really fast, because that's what we need. We need money. We have all you people to figure out the technical challenges. We need the public support and the money. Thank you. Our next question uh, is again from a center outside of headquarters. It's a Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, Scott, following on the question that was just asked by Glenn, what specifically would be one of your greatest recommendations for NASA in terms of designing a deep space habitat? So, you know, living on the, on the space station, it's a very big facility and you have a lot of privacy. And, uh, you know, even with that privacy, there are per certain parts of it that are, that are kind of loud. But from, you know, if you, if you separate the, you know, the, the environmental control system stuff from it, I would say, you know, if you're going to Mars with however many people, four people, let's say, you're going to be living on top of one another for a really long time. And like the exercise equipment, for instance, that we have at Node 3, it's very good, very functional. The treadmill is very loud, and you would be living right next to that treadmill. Um, the WHC, the toilet, is noisy. All that stuff is going to have to be in one small area. So I think, you know, human factors from a livability perspective with regards to, you know, noise abatement and privacy and lighting. And these are all things that I think are really easy to figure out, but I think will go a very, very long way into reducing... Uh, you know, reducing the crew fatigue and making them more efficient at working. And I think it's something that we could work on now, and I understand that there, are, there is funds devoted to, uh, you know, a deep space habitat. So I'm pretty excited and interesting to, to, to hear more about that and what, what people are thinking. Great. Uh, we are going to come back to headquarters for a question. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Scott, I, I understand that while you were in space, you, you're, you grew a little in length. And I was curious about uh, how long it took you to come back to your Earth size. So I, I have not come back to my Earth height yet. I grew two feet. And my, <laughs> my brother is three foot six. And now I can, like, rub his head. It was very fun for me. But actually... So I stretched an inch and a half, and there was this talk that I grew two inches. I just stretched, and then as soon as I got back to Houston, the first thing my brother wanted to do was for us to stand back to back, and we were exactly the same height. Uh, speaking of your twin brother, Mark, we had a question uh, emailed to us from headquarters. Do you think the agency should actively recruit future identical twin astronauts to continue the investigation begun with you and your brother? that was designed to understand the implications of long-term spaceflight, especially for a trip to Mars for humans? Well, you know, that's, I think that's a question for the scientists, but understanding, you know, just what I understand about something being statistically significant, you'd need a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of twin, identical twin astronauts <laughs> to get the, the N number to do that. So, you know, I think from this twin study, I think it's very interesting, and I, I hope to learn a lot about um, you know, the effects on us from a genetic perspective and th certain things we can compare with my brother and I being, you know, very similar in a lot of ways and having all this data on my brother that we've had for all these years. But, uh, you know, I think drawing any specific conclusions from that, it's not going to be statistically significant. It's going to be kind of anecdotal information and give us ideas on areas that we need to look at further. So the answer would be, you know, I'm really not sure, but I think you would be scientifically significant, you would have to have an awful lot of uh, identical twins. I'm sure they're out there. I mean, there's <laughs> a lot more people that are capable of doing this job than I am, so I'm sure you could find some of them. Great, thank you. Our next question is uh, for Goddard. Yes, um, about how long was it before you felt totally acclimatized back when you got on Earth, and was that kind of linear with respect to um, your other flights or not? You know, I, uh, I'll tell you, um, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that one because I am not there by any stretch yet. Um, I'm still fatigued somewhat at certain times, 
and my, uh, if I sit for a long time, my legs are really stiff, and my feet hurt a lot at certain times. It depends on how long I'm, I'm standing. Uh, last time when I flew, for me to feel completely normal, like adjusted to my schedule on Earth, and I mean, you get most, I think within a couple of weeks, I felt, you know, 95% normal, but that last 5% probably took me about six months before I felt completely back integrated into life on Earth. You know, I'm hoping it's around the same amount of time. I suspect it's probably going to be uh, much longer, especially considering how how sore my feet still are after two and a half months. Um, but the good news is I do feel better all the time. Good. Uh, we had a question come in from Langley, again via email. In terms of the psychology of long-term living in an enclosed space, the International Space Station, do you think it would have experienced, do you think you would have experienced improvements with virtual reality 360 uh, of Earth, of outdoor spaces on Earth or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So before I launched, I um, went to Microsoft in Seattle and looked at the, uh, the HoloLens. And, uh, you know, we were looking at that from a technical perspective, you know, how it could help us uh, in space um, doing our daily activities, whether it's uh, science, you know, basically having the scientists look over your shoulder and uh, either put procedures in your field of view or even draw in your field of view. Um, and we actually used that on the space station right before I left. We checked it out, and it was, it was pretty incredible. I, I thought that when I was using it in Microsoft, there was a big room in the background and that I didn't see with all these computers, and that's what it was driving this thing. But we got it on the space station, and it worked great. Um, and I think it has a huge capability, but it also has that capability to give you a sense for... Um, you know, being back on Earth, whether it's, you know, hiking the Grand Canyon or somewhere else. It, and it is, um, it's a pretty immersive experience. The sound quality is incredible. Tim Peake and I actually um, played this game where we were killing aliens that were busting through the hull, hull of the space station. And we were shooting at them with, uh, with our fingers. And it was fun. But, you know, that has, I think, uh, incredible potential whether it's inside the space station or even outside on, uh, uh, for EVAs and spacewalks someday, to have this, uh, you know, this heads-up display where you can you know, have people on the ground sharing the experience with you and helping you do your job. Great. Thank you. And our next question uh, comes from Ames. Hi there. My name is Grace. I'm a me mechanical and robotics engineer um, at Ames. Um, you mentioned asking permission to look after the flowers. Were there any other times when you had to just think quickly, do the maths, and improvise to figure something out? Yeah, you know, there's, there's always that. Um, you know, this is a big team effort. And, uh, you know, I think part of the, um, I wouldn't say requirement, but I think what makes certain people good at this job and other people maybe not, not as good, and there's always people of different levels of ability, but is to recognize those times. I mean, sometimes you just have to, you know, it's a team effort. You know there are smarter people than you are, and you have to, you know, completely engage them and bring them on board. And it's situational, it's situation dependent. It's, it's kind of like leadership, you know. If you're working in a team, depending on the decision, sometimes it's better to just say, hey, let's just vote on this. Uh, you know, I think also, you know, being a good leader and a teammate, uh, you need to be a good follower. I think as a leader, often, you know, I would recognize that there are other people that know more about this than I do. And, uh, you know, so you have to be willing to follow. But then there are situations on the space station or, or elsewhere where it's an emergency and you need to be the dictator. You know, you decide what you're going to do and you're going to start telling people what they need to do. And I think in the operations that we do on the space station, you know, a lot of times, you know, during the daily normal operations you know you can engage the ground but there are other times you know if it's a spacewalk or robotics you were mentioning you work in the robotics field uh, you know you just need to to do it you just need to get the get the job done decide what needs to be done and do it so it's really uh, situational dependent great thank you uh, we're going to go uh, to johnson space center before coming back to headquarters for a question johnson space center 
Hi, sir. My name is Karan. I'm an industrial designer. Um, my question is pertaining to life on the ISS. As I understand it, every second is scheduled. Um, I'm wondering what you would have done in your free time and if you believe that on trips to Mars, if every second has to be scheduled to avoid um, crew getting anxious. I think we need to give the crew as much autonomy to, to do the, to manage the schedule as you can, but at the same time get all the work done. And that's a, that's a balance. And there's times when it's more appropriate to just say, hey, there's a few things you need to do today and go ahead and do it. And other times where you have to schedule it very closely and the ground has to monitor it, you know, and figuring that out is a challenge. But you would never want to put the crew in a situation where they're working all the time because you do need some free time to decompress and to do things that, you know, you feel are, um, you know, conducive to your, your mental health and, and recharging your batteries. So, um, yeah, I, I just think it's a balance. Um, but that is the hardest thing for me about living on the space station for any period of time is that because of how you're scheduled, you're always thinking ahead to what is the next thing I have to do, whether it's uh, five minutes from now, five hours from now, um, or if it's the weekend on Monday morning. Whereas, you know, often in our daily lives here, especially on the weekends when you have time off, you're kind of doing things at your own pace. And I think that's very important to your, you know, maintaining your energy level, which is what I really tried to do on the space station. I recognized that I couldn't keep the same pace I did on my last flight, and the way I tried to manage my fatigue level was to just really try to control and kind of temper down how much extra stuff I was doing beyond what was, was required. But, uh, you know, free time, I think, is very important. Great, thank you. We're going to uh, go to headquarters now for a question. Hi, Scott. I'm Jason. I'm an engineer here. I'm working towards my doctorate in nuclear engineering. What um, advice can you give to expiring engineers? Well, you know, I've always told people that, you know, I've been in a very privileged position. I think everyone in the astronaut, you know, I think, you know, people that just work in NASA in general, you know, it's kind of a privileged position in society. You know, people respect what we do. You know, we generally get universal support. It's a very important mission. It's something we all believe very strongly in. But, you know, when people ask me for advice about, you know, career advice, what, what do I think they should do, whether they want to be an astronaut or go do something else, I always tell them to pick something that they're very, very passionate about, feel, um, you know, very strongly about, and then, and then work hard at it. And I think if you choose a field that you want to work in because you inherently like that, I think that's better than choosing something for, for some other reason. Um, because, you know, work is, you know, it's a very, very important part of our lives. It's a big part of our lives, and it's, uh, you know, something that we, you know, we do for a very long time, so it might as well be something you enjoy doing. Thank you. Uh, we are going to go back to Glenn for another question. Hi, Scott. Um, my name is Jill Noble, and I just have a quick question. I heard on the news, speaking about fatigue and energy levels, I was wondering if you had a chance to use the specially designed coffee mugs that were up on the space station. Yeah, I did, and that was, uh, yeah, those, that was pretty fascinating, actually, um, how those worked. And, uh, you know, I think using that, that cup every day uh, when you have a bag that you can fill with coffee is, uh, you know, not something I think the crew would do just to drink coffee out of. But it has very many more important scientific Im implications about how we move fluids around, whether they're in a uh, fuel tank on a rocket or other things. I kind of had the idea when I was up there watching, you know, coffee move from one cup to another just because of the shape of the cup. You just put a, put a, a tube between the two and the coffee will empty in microgravity out of one cup and the other. I was thinking, you know, what if we could make a space toilet that had a bunch less moving parts, maybe no moving parts? You know, how great would that be if we didn't have to repair you know, this toilet, which works very well, <coughs> but, is, but is very complicated. And, you know, when we're going to Mars and we're turning our urine into water, if that toilet doesn't work, the crew's going to die. I mean, it's reality. You need, you're going to need that capability to have this closed loop system. So, you know, using that kind of technology to build, you know, a better space toilet would be, would be great. And I, I suggested that, and I hope people are looking into that. 
Thank you. And now we're going to Ames for a question. Um, yes, thank you. Um, hello, sir. My name is Anima. I am an astronaut aspirant, and uh, as a part of the several things I am doing to prepare myself, uh, one of the things is I've been participating in simulated missions like HERA uh, at Johnson Space Center, where I got to be a commander for a 14-day mission last June. So my question is, uh, you, you are familiar with HERA, right, and what we've been doing there. Um, from your one-year experience on the International Space Station, what do you think? A lot of people have been following me and my journey. So what do you think? They ask me, um, is this relevant um, to be, becoming an actual astronaut? Do you think and it helps an astronaut aspirant like me to get these kind of experiences? And uh, is it worth um, doing these kind of uh, simulations? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, I think any anything you do that can demonstrate um, not only your technical abilities, which is a small part of this job, it's also just you know demonstrating teamwork, leadership, um, just being kind of a generalist, a well-rounded person. You know, when you're on the space station, as you know, you know you're not calling the repair person. You're the plumber, the electrician. You're the scientist, the doctor, the dentist. I mean, you do all of these things, and I think, you know, opportunities to demonstrate and to practice all these different, you know, types of activities that you might have to do in space or, or elsewhere is, is important to, you know, aspiring astronauts. But it's also an important thing, you know, just in general, I mean, just these, like, general, you know, life skills. But, uh, you know, the really important thing though, you know, is teamwork is very, very important because, <clears throat> you know, one person can't do everything. And, uh, you know, it's really important to get along with your crewmates, to work well as a team. And, uh, you know, that's, I think, one of the things that NASA does so well. Okay. Uh, one more question from email. This one comes from Goddard. How does being in space, looking down at Earth from a totally unique perspective, change your perception of social, political, ethical issues, given that you have the advantage of seeing the human race as a whole? Yeah, it, you know, living on the space station for that long really has changed me and the way that, you know, I'm going to live my life. Uh, you know, you live with very little up there um, for a long time. I wore the same pair of pants for six months just to see how, you know, how little I could live with. And uh, I'm adjusting to life very well back on Earth. I've only been wearing these for a month. <laughs> so, so please don't get too close. But uh, yeah, you know, there are times on the space station when you definitely get the feeling that, you know, you're here and everyone else is, is down there. And we follow the news very closely, or at least I do when I'm in space. And, uh, you know, most of it's bad news. And you do get the, uh, you know, you do become more uh, empathetic about, you know, the bad stuff that, um, you know, happens down here often. And, you know, also, like I was saying earlier with the environment, to see it over the, see the earth. You know, when I flew 159 days, I would look out the window and I think, ah, it's just, smoggy there because it's that time of year, but when you see, you know, China and India always being covered in pollution over the course of a year, and then seeing how just by, you know, making a little bit of a change, how you can affect the environment, um, very important. You know, we take care of the systems on the space station because, you know, those are the systems that keep us alive. And the same thing is true here. You know, the environment is what keeps us alive, and I think, you know, for, you know, the rest of my life, I'm going to be more of a, an advocate for people uh, doing better in that regard. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, that's uh, time for our last question. Uh, but we appreciate your, uh, your participation today and sharing your insights. Thank you. And again, you know, thank, you for your, thank you for your efforts and in, in, you know, those of you that worked on this mission and just working at NASA in general. Um, you know, this 20 years I've spent in this agency has really been the highlight of my professional life, and I hope to continue to be involved as much as I can, but, you know, it is a team effort, and, uh, you know, I think us at NASA, you people, make stuff that seems impossible possible. So thank you very much.
Thank you for an engaging conversation. Please remember you can keep track of NASA's missions via NASA's social channels on Twitter at NASA, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, and Snapchat.